Welcome to the MMA Fan Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Stu and Blake. Hello and welcome to the MMA Fan Podcast. I'm Stu Whiffin. Beside me always, Blake Harrison. How are you, mate? I'm good, mate. I'm good. How are you doing? I'm all right. I'm all right. So this is going to be an interesting one. This is um, looking back over uh, 288, um, which happened just a few hours ago. We're, we're recording this first thing Sunday morning uh, in the wake of all the action. Um, we've both kind of been hit with family commitments and, and bits and pieces. Yeah. And I was watching it this morning and like, I sort of had to, I tried to make sure I watched um, the, the three fights at the top of the card. And uh, I couldn't have the volume up because I had people there coming down for breakfast and stuff. And it was like, oh, I do like family, but I really want to watch the US. <laughs> <laughs> I do like um, your family, but please go away for three hours. Exactly, so. exactly. Um, uh, yeah, uh, no, I, so, I had so, a same for you. I had a similar thing. I mean, like my, my brother-in-law was over and he was chatting to my wife for a bit and I was like, I can't quite hear the commentary, but it'd be really rude for me to just Can turn this up and drown out your up. conversation. <laughs> Shut up, guys. Um, but uh, so, yeah, so like during the Gilbert Burns, uh, Bilal Muhammad fight, I was like, what? I think they said something about his arms injured. Gilbert's arms injured? What's going yeah. on with it? It's something, something's going on. But I could never quite work out what was going on. So it was slightly frustrating, but... The, uh, the the I suppose the alternative is to stay up super late and be absolutely wrecked for a good few days afterwards. Um, and I think there's some cards where I'm willing to do that. Mm. And this on paper just wasn't that card for me. But I think we can do our best to run through all of the main action of it. I mean, I've watched everything, not the fight past prelims, but the prelims, I've watched the, the main card. You, I think, haven't quite seen as much as me, but no. we are going to get into the big stuff because at least we've all seen that. So yes. why don't we start with the main event and we start with Sterling versus Cejudo. Um, what were your thoughts on the fight overall? Because you were worried it was going to be a very dull affair. Did you think it was very dull? No, I thought it was quite entertaining. Um, I wish I could have heard more of the commentary because I think I would have maybe um, understood a little bit more of what might have been going on with corners and what they were saying and stuff like that. Yeah. But um, I thought it was it was really decent. I thought um, I did think Aljo won. Um, yeah. I, I, I thought he um, his movement was really good, and I, I thought Henry definitely kind of pulled back towards the end. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I thought initially the way that Aljo was controlling the octagon and it felt the size difference was really, really apparent in them early rounds. It, it felt like you could watch in Henry, like literally doing two steps just to try and get in. The range yes. was so vast. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it, that, that first takedown, he seemed to take that very comfortably. Um, and we didn't see loads more of that. Um, so I don't know what, you know... Uh, what Matt Serra and stuff had, had, had been instilling him um, into Aljo. To, 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 his game plan clearly worked because at, at times I thought Henry looked a little out of ideas and and looked like some of the, 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 the shots he was throwing were quite wild. Um, but I think mm -hmm. that was just because Aljo was controlling the range and distance and his footwork was great. Um, but I'm taking nothing away from Zuda. I thought Zuda was going to nick the, the, the win in the pre-show. Um, but I think we saw, um, I mean, the, just the size difference when they both got in there, yeah, it man. was ridiculous. Yeah. Like it looked yeah. like completely separate weight classes. Um, but, uh, but props to, to Henry, uh, an, an incredible account of himself. Um, obviously he was up on one of the scorecards from what I, from what I, um, gather. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. But all, all, all three judges scored it, uh, you know, 48, 47, I believe, yeah. but two of them in favor of Sterling, one in favor of, mm. Cejudo. Mm. Um, I, again, I was, by this point, both my uh, brother-in-law, my wife, and my two children were downstairs. Oh, and my selfish. son, so selfish, and my son was punching my feet regularly 
Like, I think he was inspired by the te- what was on the telly. And I quite enjoyed that at one point during the prelims. I wasn't really watching the prelims because I was holding pads for him and he had his little kiddie gloves on and he was throwing some shots at the pads. And I was like, well, do you know what? I, I'm quite, I quite like this. This is, yeah. I, I'm all right. If, he, if he's getting into a sport I love and all that, then that's, that's fine. Mm. Um, but it did mean that I couldn't score the fight as um, kind of appropriately or, or strictly as, as I would have liked to because I was slightly distracted. But I have to say, with my slightly distracted scoring, I scored it just about three of three rounds were very, very close, but I scored it just about in favor of Cejudo. Oh, really? Um, yeah. I mean, again, I'm, I'm, I have no problems with the scorecards because again, I, I wasn't scoring it as, as well as I would have liked to. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I gave round one quite easily to, to Sterling. Round two, I put was very close. I, I've got big question marks over this, but I put Henry because I had to put someone and I was just like, I think Henry, but I'm not sure. It could have gone either way for me round two. Round three, I thought was Henry's. And then round four, I thought was Sterling's. And round five, I thought could have gone either way again. Oh, I thought I think Henry I gave to Henry. Round. Yeah, yeah I, I gave it to Henry. So I had them 2-2 going into the final round and I thought Henry nicked it. But I... I didn't mind either way because it, some of those rounds were so close, mm. or it seemed so to me anyway, from my slightly, uh, you know, unfortunate scoring position that uh, it did, I didn't mind either way. Did you enjoy the fight? I did enjoy the fight. Yeah, um, I, I, I thought it was really interesting to see the wrestling thing. And as I said we discussed beforehand. You were talking about Al Jermaine's uh, wrestling being so inferior to Henry's, but. When they get in the cage, when they do the like, you know, up against the fence, all of that, mm. the, the kind of Olympic level wrestling, it's not always about that that style of wrestling. And, and MMA wrestling yeah. can be slightly different. And I felt that Aljo showed that. There was one takedown he tried to do on Henry. And did you see Henry did like a Jean Claude Van Damme split? Yeah. To get out of it. <laughs> Aljo eventually got him down anyway. But I was like, how how wide are his legs going to go? I've never seen someone have their legs mm. that wide to try and prevent a takedown before. Mm. Uh, so I love that. It reminded me of that scene in Kickboxer where they're just like pulling <laughs> his legs down. It's like, ah. I was just waiting for a guy with a coconut in a tree to say, ready to protect? <laughs> boom, boom. Throw the coconut down on him. Uh, if you haven't seen Kickboxer, go and watch it. It's a great movie. Uh, does it still hold up 20 years later? I don't know. Um, I'm going to um, lean on the fact I don't think it probably does. No, it's probably very problematic. I don't know. I mean, and I watched that when I was like way too young. I don't yeah. know what my parents were doing, but I was a child watching mm. Kickboxer, and there's certainly some scenes in that that I shouldn't have been watching, <laughs> but I digress. Uh, so, yeah, don't watch it with the kids. It's not a family film. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I felt like um, it, either way, I was happy with, with the result. I think also this result is the best result for the division because I do believe if Henry won, yeah, he might have gone on and fought Sean O'Malley, sure, but he would have just been trying to get the Volk fight, trying to move up in weight, blah, blah, blah. Whereas mm. I don't think Aljo's going to do... Well, he might do that, but I don't know. It doesn't bother me as much as the Cejudo one, I suppose, because Cejudo sort of tried to hold the UFC to ransom before. Because when he retired, he wasn't retiring because he wanted to retire. He retired because he thought, no, I want bigger fights, I want more money, um, and I'm just going to hold these two belts uh, at ransom. And the UFC didn't play ball with him and they did the right thing and they just cracked on. And it was one of the biggest mistakes I think Cejudo will ever make because it was his prime kind of years to really earn good money and have some great fights. And he lost out on those. Um, so, yeah, in terms of going forward... Well, did he retire? Did he not? Did he, he took his gloves off. Apparently, um, I didn't see it on the footage, but I did read that Dana cut his gloves off for him. Oh yeah, he was just struggling with his gloves, and Dana helped him out with the with the gloves. I think it, it, Henry seemed a bit confused, unsure what what he's going to do going forward. I think um, Henry was never really interested in, I think, coming back and having a bunch of fights or making like any kind of legitimate run towards a title by taking out contenders. He just wanted the big money fights and you big know, money fights that. or or the or or gold. You know, did he want that belt? Both. Both. He, because I, I think, I think there's know, big money fights there for him, but I don't think he's getting that shot anytime soon. 
I, I don't know how much there is. I don't think it's a big money fight fighting Marab or Corey Sandhagen or Petty Yarn. They're not big money fights. They're just fights to try and get yourself into a position where you can fight for the belt again. Um, has he got, uh, could he get one or two wins at Bantamweight and then rematch Sterling or fight whoever's there? Absolutely, because he's a massive name. And that was a very, very close fight. Mm. Um, and, you know, credit to him. Three years off, 36 years old, fighting a guy that's clearly bigger than him. Like, he he showed he's got true quality as a mixed mm -hmm. martial artist. Like, Henry Cejudo is no joke. He's a very, very, very talented fighter. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but going forward, I think what he wants is big money fights that are also legacy fights. And I think ultimately what that means is to try and become a three-weight world champion. I think he wants that Volkanovski fight badly, but this is really setting back because now, so, okay. So, so for Henry, you could, you could fight one or two guys at bantamweight if you wanted, but you're not really gaining anything from that. Mm -hmm. I don't see why he would do it. Why is he going to fight Mirab, Stan Hagen, uh, Petion? Like, what does he gain from it? Or he gets closer to another bantamweight title shot. Big deal. He's already been the champ there. I think if you're Henry and you think, I really do want to achieve something great and I've only got, say, like a year or two left to really do that. I'll be 38 in two years' time. Um, I think goes, I, I, I think he'll be very small for the division. And I, I think maybe having lost to Aljamain, he realises that at featherweight he'd be in big, big trouble. But if he still wants to really achieve that, and you never know, like luck may end up on his side, pop straight up to featherweight. You're going to fight a top five guy right away because you're such a big name. He could go up to featherweight and fight Max Holloway, Brian Ortega, Arnold Allen. And if he gets a win off of any of those, next fight is a title shot. So if, if that's his main goal, then I would advise him, look, if you think you can hang with the featherweights, then that's what you do. Because the only way you're going to achieve true greatness and get that third uh, third weight belt is by doing something like that. Because you can't do champ be champ now. You can't run through two or three bantamweights, then win the belt and then go up because you'll be too old. So just pop straight up to featherweight, take a massive fight at featherweight. You'll be probably an underdog because you'll be undersized. But if you get that win... That's it then. You're the number one guy because you're such a big name. And, you know, Max has lost three times. Ortega's lost. Arnold Allen now is going to gonna have to rebuild himself. So any of those wins, and I, I, I think he's he's there. Do, do I think he would beat a Volkanovski or anyone else? No. But if that's what he's trying to achieve, that I think is the quickest route to do it. Yeah. I mean, the only other alternative I can foresee where he might get to fight for the bantamweight belt again is Aljo fights Sugar Sean and if Aljo wins I'm imagining then he's probably going to go up um, and if he goes up what happens with that belt does he you know is he going to defend that belt at, at bantamweight I don't know if if or even if Sugar Sean beats Aljo then Cejudo Sugar Sean, is that a fight that could happen? I'm presuming Mirab would get that shot. Um, but And I think Mirab would want that Sugar Sean shot because it all got a little yeah. bit tasty last night, didn't it? Did you, oh, oh, do you know man. what? I was pissing myself when I see it happen. Because he obviously just, uh, for those that haven't seen it, um, what happened afterwards, they called Sugar Sean in uh, to the Octagon to, to face off against Sterling. And, uh, and he had the... the the actual Michael Jackson red leather on, like, yeah, and uh, and he's walked in and he's took the jacket off. Obviously, he was wearing nothing underneath the jacket, um, and uh, and he must have just given it to one of the officials whilst he's facing off against Aljo. I think Meanwhile, he just chucked it on the floor. And Mirab just picked it up and put it on. <laughs> and put it on. I loved it when I saw that in the background. I thought that was so funny. <laughs> yeah. And then obviously off camera, I wonder if there's any social media clips of someone having their phone out yeah. page side where you can see what really happened. Because yeah. I saw Mirab floating around in the back with the red lever on, just <laughs> laughing. And I was like, "This is so, so good. I really want to see this more. I love Mirab." Yeah. As soon as I saw him fighting the ice that cracked his head a few years ago. I just like, I love this guy. And stuff like stealing, stealing Sean O'Malley's coat <laughs> and wearing it with a cheeky grin. I'm here for that content all day long. Oh. Um, 
so yeah and then obviously sean's got pissed off with morale but that's off camera and then I start, like something seems to happen between the two of them there so that's going to be a really fun build up i think yeah. with Marab floating around and then you've got sugar sean and aljamade sterling i think it's great i think in terms of um of that fight going forward one thing that was very apparent, and I think DC said this uh, in the aftermath of it, of it happening as well, is doesn't Sean look big compared to Sterling? And people don't often look big compared to um, big Aljamain Sterling. Both, I think. I mean, he didn't look as muscular as Aljamain Sterling, but he still looked wide. He still looked broad. And, and it, like he didn't look like a skinny little twig stood next to him or anything. Mm. And I, I felt like he looked a really good size to, to Al Jermaine. I mean, obviously... Yeah, but he's not on weight, is he? No, of course. That's a very good point. Yes, he's he's, he's not on weight. He's walking around. Um, I mean, Aljo will probably put on, what, like 10 more pounds now, because obviously he was rehydrated at that point as well. But I think that fight is going to be super interesting because striking-wise, Aljo can't hold a candle to Sean O'Malley. Sean will obliterate him with straight shots, I think. But in terms of the grappling, we haven't seen enough from Sean O'Malley in terms of grappling defence, in terms of his jiu-jitsu game and, and stuff like that. So I think um, I think it's going to be very, very interesting to see whether or not Aljo could just sort of have his way with him in terms of the grappling and just drag him around the cage like he said he was going to do. Um, or if Sean will just land something big early and be able to keep away from him. I think it's going to be absolutely fascinating. And I'm actually far more interested in that fight. The face-off got me. You know what I'm like. I love a bit of drama, a bit of, a bit of playground drama. And I, I'm all in. I, I, I went into it. Um, I felt it, it took the momentum out of um, the, the interview process. I thought it was... It kind of spoiled Aljo's moment a little bit. Oh, um, it's so boring, Stu. And, uh, and, and boring, I thought, and, and do you know what? As all it was going on, I was just looking at Henry in the background. And you know I think he's a melt, but I felt sorry for Henry. He was just standing there with his gloves in his hand, just going, oh, fucking hell. And, like, and yeah, I don't know. I, I, I weren't feeling it. Don't get me wrong. Like, yeah. We all have a face-off. Um, um, the UFC ain't stupid. They know that there's a big pan note attached to uh, Sugar Sean O'Malley, so they're going to bring him in. And I think they should do stuff like that more often. I, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. There's moments in time where you go, no, let's not do that. Let's give, I don't know, like, say, say they had say they had Drickus Duplessis outside when Adesanya beat Pereira mm. and they brought him in. I'd be like, no, no, because this is such a big moment for Adesanya. Mm. Um this, you know, that, let's let's just stick with stick with him, stick with that. And there's moments in history where someone's had a big moment, someone's retiring. There's such, been such a build up to the fight, all that stuff. But this was great for me, and I, I, I'm I'm happy to see more of you know contenders stepping in and building up the fight yeah. as soon as the last fight finishes. That's what wasn't that what Chael Sonnen said? He said the build up to the last fight starts the second the first fight is over. Mm. Uh, the, sorry, the build up to the next fight starts the second the last fight is over. Yeah, and that's what good champions and good kind of storytellers in sport do. You know, that's why you had after uh, Makachev won the belt against Oliveira, Khabib was straight on the mic for Makachev, being like, "We want Volk in Australia," mm. and everyone's like, "Whoa!" And then everyone's like, "Look, what you did against Oliveira was really impressive." Mm. But we're building up to the next one now, and we're really excited about this. So, yeah, I, I, I would like to see more of that. But I, I think the fight between Sugar and Sterling, I, I think it'll either, I think it'll sort of be one-way traffic either way. I think Sugar will either knock him out quickly because Sterling can't get to the grappling and his striking is just so inferior to Sugar's. Or I think Sean O'Malley will be dragged around the octagon for a bit and yeah. Sterling would stab his way with him and probably submit him. So yeah, but that'll be that'll be exciting nonetheless. Yeah, is there a date on that? There is not a date. Sterling was asking for September mm. in the cage, and then <clears throat> um, Dana White in the post fight press conference says he's looking at August in Boston. Right. So yeah, 
I tell you one thing that was super interesting about the whole night that I found really surprising and a little bit felt a little bit sad for for Sterling actually was they were fighting in New Jersey, mm. which is down the road from his hometown in in New York, and he everyone was cheering for Henry. Mm. They were cheering for Henry. They were booing Sterling after the fight a little bit, mm. and you're like, mate, you're in your hometown, mm. and you're still getting no love. And and I felt like he feels that. I don't know what um, what front he's going to put on it, but I, I think you can see in him a little bit where he's like, oh, but you're like, why? Why are you booing me? And I felt, I genuinely felt a little bit sad uh, for Sterling there, but there you go. But I think it could be really interesting going forward. Sugar Sean, and again, if we if we do get it in August or September, that, that's you know, it's only four or five months away. That'd be fun. Yeah, I mean, but you know, we have to be mindful of fighters fighting too much in succession, and that brings us on to to the next fight, I think. And uh, look at that segue! Hey, look at you, 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 you professional! I loved it. Oh, look <laughs> at that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Stuart with him. It's my years at Rada, darling. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so Bilal Mohamed versus Gilbert Burns. Um, yeah. On the whole, I found this not the most exciting fight to watch. Um, yeah. It was it was all right. It was a, a, a unanimous decision um, over five rounds that, that went to Bilal Mohamed, and, and rightly so. Um, and <sighs> Bilal Mohamed, I thought, didn't do anything wrong. I thought he fought... A smart fight, yeah, and he was very effective. That the, the the left kicks were phenomenal, and they were, you know, Gilbert was in the end fighting a lot with his hands so low because he didn't want to eat any more of them kicks. And I thought his takedown defense was really, really solid. Um, was he exciting? No. Uh, was Gilbert Burns exciting? No. Um, did Gilbert Burns look like he'd had too many fights in too short a space of time? I think so. Yes. Um, he and and was that... apparently injured. Well, so this is something that um, I couldn't hear the commentary at this point, but um, at the end of the fight, they showed something back. Was it in the first round? He he, he shoots and he basically his weight and Balal Mohammed's weight comes down on the on, on his shoulder. And apparently he didn't then throw his left hand at all throughout the fire. I, I mean, yeah, I again, this was a situation where I had family in the room and I couldn't quite hear the commentary. And as much as there's moments where we can get frustrated by the commentary because someone says, oh, well, they were on top for the whole round. So that's their round. It's like, no, mate, they did no damage and they mm. got hit quite hard before that. So they've lost that round. But anyway, as much as we can have problems with the commentary, sometimes you do need it to tell you that mm. stuff. Because I did see Gilbert Burns sort of like shake his arm out at one point to try and, I don't know, either pop it back or or just shake off whatever nerve thing mm. was going on with him. But uh, but I wasn't aware of exactly what was going on, so it was really tricky to work it out. But yeah, it does seem like he did something quite early on to that left hand. Yeah. And Gilbert Burns has got a mean left hook, and that just mm. took that weapon away for him completely. I mean, wasn't it a... Uh, was it a, I'm trying to think what he hit Usman with when he dropped Usman in there. That was a straight left or, mm. or what, but I can't remember. But point is, it was... It, it you were you were getting half Gilbert Burns and yeah. that could be because too many fights in quick succession for him or it could be that just bad luck he would have had a great fight but he got injured early and that's just one of those things. Um, I have to say I am in favour of number one contender fights, particularly if they're in that co-main event slot, being five rounders. I sort of wish this one wasn't. It was not exciting. It, you know, it's one of those ones they've made it five rounds. I'm thinking this could be great, and it just never lived up to it. And it would have been nicer if it was three rounds and we just cracked on a bit quicker. But them's the breaks. Um, so, I wonder what's going to go on with Bilal now because well, this was. Did Dana say anything about Bilal? I, I've not heard anything yet, but um, I've not had a chance to watch the post fight yet, but. There's no fans going, yes, we really want to see Bilal Mohamed Leon Edwards. There's no fans saying that. I I'd probably say I'd like to see that because I think it's an easier win for Leon than what Colby is. Um, so he's on a 10-fight unbeaten streak. I know you've got the yeah. no contest with Leon with the eye poke and everything. Yeah. But is that including that no contest? He's yeah. 10 fights unbeaten. 
you get to a point where you, you have to reward these people for putting yeah. together these these win streaks and taking these fights. However, it just it's just not it was not exciting at mm. at all. And I, I yeah, I just I, I, I worry is like I said in the in the pre fight show, timing is everything with this. Mm. If if Colby and Leon fight soon, then yes, I think Bilal probably will get the next shot and it'll be fine. But if Colby and Leon don't fight until October, which is what I think Leon's alluded to, then you would imagine there's going to be another London card in March. That's their staple. They do another London card in March. And if Leon wins in October, he will probably headline, hopefully another pay-per-view, the March London card five months later. That's when Bilal would fight for the belt. So you're talking a 10 and a half month wait for Bilal Mohammed, are fans going to give a shit in 10 and a half months' time about Bilal Mohammed? I really don't think they are after that performance. In the meantime, Shavkat Rachmanov can reel off two or three wins. Hamzat, Hamzat Shemaev, who Dana keeps talking about going up to 185, but if for some reason he can get a fight at 170 and win, he's straight in there, surely leapfrogging Bilal, not out of any justice or, or meritocracy, but just that that's just the, the nature of the business. So I, I, I worry for Bilal a little bit after that. And uh, yeah, we'll have to wait and see what happens. It is, it's undeniable. He should be fighting Leon Edwards in the next, in the Leon's next defense. He should not be Kobe Covenant. It should be Bilal yeah. Mohammed. Um, it's just not, it, oh, it's just not sellable. I, I just think the UFC is just going to go, because as you touched on on the pre-fight show, outside of the UK, how many people are, you know, absolutely like 100% huge super fans of Leon Edwards? Maybe not. Like, you know, he's he's got them, you know, he's got the belt, he's got the wins. We love him because we're, we're, we're you know, we're British fans. I wonder, like... I don't know. I I, I think the, the, the Covington fight is... is marketable we've not seen colby fight for ages he's a hype machine yeah. it's, it's it makes for an exciting fight um and like you say like you look at shavkat there's a superstar in the making you know and i, and I think i don't know is Bilal mohammed gonna have to fight him is he gonna be in you know waiting around and then he's gonna end up i think to fight shavkat rachmanov which my god no one wants that fight and and he has at least put the ball in, in like their court, so to speak, by going, go on then. I, I'm I'm 10 fights unbeaten. Now someone's got to do something special. So I don't think he'd have to fight Shavkat unless Shavkat gets two decent wins under yeah. his belt. Uh, I think Shavkat needs to beat two top 10 guys. Then that would put pressure on Bilal Mohamed to take that fight. But what does he do in the meantime? Because, like you say, if, if Leon's not fighting Colby till the you know the end of the year, and then obviously we've got to wait until, like you say, like March next year to to maybe see the next defense should uh, Leon beat Colby. What does Bilal Mohammed do? He can't just sit around for a year because he's not you... got the stock. He's not got the he's not got the star power. And, and I feel like we're hating on him, and we shouldn't because, you know, he's done nothing wrong. He has won every fight, and he has beaten everybody in front of him and uh, relatively convincing, convincingly. But last night, I don't know. Had we have seen the Gilbert that fought Usman maybe in there last night, I think we might have had a bit more of an exciting fight. Um, but I, yeah. I just wanted to sort of... I'm going to just sort of keep talking about what might be happening for Bilal. I do think we should touch on on, on Gilbert and, and what happens for him because well, I... before we do, before we do, I think I, if if I'm if I'm Bilal's manager right now, I think I've worked out exactly what Bilal should do. Bilal needs to be saying to Dana, "I'm the backup fighter for Colby versus Leon in October." Let's say that is happening in October, mm -hmm. which is what Leon has said, which is Abu Dhabi. That is going to be very pro Bilal Mohammed. Bilal's Muslim, you know, he observes Ramadan, all those things. If he goes over to Abu Dhabi, the crowd will love him and show him support. If a fighter drops out and he can sneak in there in Abu Dhabi, the crowd will go nuts for him. But even if he doesn't, if he can just go over to Abu Dhabi, 
make weight and get like half a paycheck or whatever they get for just making weight and being there, being there that week, having people like praise him and, and make a scene around him because he's like, uh, obviously he's not hometown boy, he's American, but they, they love their Muslim fighters over in, in Abu Dhabi. So he would do really well to have people shown to be caring about him ultimately. And if he can just get a little bit of needle and a little bit of altercation and beef with both Colby and Leon, over during that fight week, that could be massive for him. That could be mm. absolutely massive. If he can get some headlines because he's had an altercation with Leon, an altercation with uh, with Colby during is he that their guy, fight though? week. Is yeah, he I that think guy? he could be. I think he would be because I think he's learning. I think he I think he will be. I think there's already beef between him and Colby, so that will be easily done. Leon, he's got the whole eye poke thing, like whatever. It's not as good. But he's definitely got some beef with Colby. He can definitely get into the headlines. And I think that's what he has to do to try and make people care about him fighting either Leon or Colby next. Okay. You wanted to talk about Burns, though. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to have seen, you know, it was one of the things that, you know, not just us, but I guess most people that that love their, their, their MMA spoke about the fact that, you know, Gilbert's had to make weight three times in very close proximity. Yeah. What was that going to take out of him? And it took something out of him. I think it was it was so apparent that he didn't have that pop to him that he normally does. And and yeah, he just seemed a little flat. I thought. Um, don't get me wrong, still you know put on a solid performance, but I, I think Gilbert Burns can can do a lot better than that. Um, I think, like you say, he he just said yes to these fights and as we spoke about again in the pre-show, he wants that title shot. And I think he thought this is the best way to do it. Just keep moving forward. Just keep taking these fights, winning these fights. And, you know, we could have had a very different conversation now. We could be saying, well, look, you know, Gilbert's next in line, but that's kind of not going to happen now. And so my worry is now for Gilbert Burns, what, what does he do? Because he's not going to get a title shot anytime soon now. Like that's no. th th there's another there's another two fights in 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 that for him. Who's he gonna get? Shavka. This is what I'm thinking, and it's like <laughs> I mean, first of all, Gilbert, though, have an holiday, mate. Yeah, yeah, man. Don't don't fight until the end of the year. Don't fight until November, December. Take or even January. Just take take a nice long break. You've earned it. Um, but yeah, 36 years old. He's only going to be fighting for maybe like two more years at most, really. Mm. Um, so yeah, fuck it. Take you did well. Your stock rose against Hamzat. See if Shavkat maybe gets a win in the next three, four months, and then go. Yeah, go on in. I'll fight that guy. Um, that'd be that'd be a, a big move. And and if you yeah, if you stop the hype train that is Shavkat Rachmanov, people will be going. Oh, I want to see Burns fight for the belt now. So that's maybe your way back. I think the fans love Gilbert Burns, though. I think he's, um, yeah. you know, people are always going to be excited to watch Gilbert fight. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm not holding last night against him in any way, shape or form, because I think it was just one fight too many. Um, well, and the injury. Let's not, let's not yeah, 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 uh, yeah. discredit that. I mean, of course, of course. It, left hook is a big weapon for Gilbert Burns. Mm -hmm. Not to mention, I don't think he was ever going to get Bilal Muhammad down anyway, because Muhammad's wrestling is too good. But you can't shoot on someone and actually kind of offset their balance if you're doing it with one arm. So, yeah, yeah so, you know, let's just let's just hope that Gilbert's not too badly injured. It was like a minor injury. He can get mm -hmm. it sorted, have a break, get whatever done, done to his shoulder, get that sort of repaired, whatever. And then maybe he's back November, December, January in a big fight, maybe against like a Shavkat Rachmanov, and, and that could be massive. Amen to that. Right. What we got next? What we got next? Andraj Janan, which I mean, I, if, that, if he was whoa. looking for fireworks, <laughs> there you go. Oh boy. <laughs> uh, Janan, one of the winners of uh, Performance of the Night bonus after this knockout of Andraj. I mean, one thing that struck me incredibly early on was I was thinking to myself, looking at them up against each other in, in the octagon, I was like, if I had to pick one fighter here that recently had a fight at 125, I'd be picking Jan Han. Like, yeah. she looked massive. She looked absolutely huge compared to Andrade. I was like, She's the biggest fighter at female for now. 
<laughs> oh god uh, still i just always flash to an image of it this is so niche but an image of you as tree beard from lord of the rings just kicking around a bunch of team alpha male guys i remember who we talked to, we talked to Corey mckenna didn't we and then afterwards because we wouldn't have had the bottle to say it while she was on the line we started talking about our small team alpha male and you as a six foot five tree beard just <laughs> Oh, a little Lord of the Rings reference for you there that, that care. Um, anyway, I can never get that image out of my head when it be mentioned to you about Um Anyway, yeah, Janan looked much bigger than yeah. Andraj, but also she looked faster. She looked faster. This was by far the best performance Yan Janan has ever had. This mm. was an unbelievable performance. And I don't know that Andraj was really respecting Janan as much as she clearly should have been but she was just trying to wing the big punches at her and Janan was not just skipping away but then firing back with the straight shots and in the end she was chasing her around the, the octagon with the, those kind of like looping left hooks and Janan just ran away ran away then stopped planted overhand right and then boom that, that was it a couple of hammer fists later and it, it was game over I have never been more excited in my life to see the next Jan Janan fight yeah. And all of her fights previously have been like, eh, fine, whatever. I'm super excited to see the next Yan Janan fight after that performance. And who knows, it, it could be a title shot. Dana White wants to go to China. He really wants to break that market. When's the best I time mean, to go to China? Two Chinese fighters. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's written to be, to, to be done, isn't it? It's amazing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I don't know what you do with her. I mean, I don't think Zhang's got a fight booked. I don't know if Xianan would come back quickly. Uh, or, or what, I, I don't know how that would happen. But um, the other name in uh, in the mix is Amanda Lemos. But mm -hmm. both Yan Jonan and Amanda Lemos now only on two fight win streaks. Yeah. So an obvious thing to do, which again, it would keep Zhang Wei Li out of, uh, out of <laughs> defending her belt for a long, long, long time, maybe, which is maybe not fair on Zhang or the, the belt in general, fans, all that stuff. But Something you could very easily do is a very clear cut number one contender fight between Yan Janan and Amanda Lemos to see who who takes that. Um, but yeah, I, as I say, never been more excited to see the next Yan Janan fight in my life. I am now very happy to watch that fight, whether it be Zhang Wei Li, Amanda Lemos, whoever, I'll be watching that. Yeah, as I say, with an actual bit of glee in my heart, yeah, 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 rather yeah. than just going whatever. Oh, it was so exciting. Uh, and it was just watching, as you said, the them steps back, stop, and she's completely planted herself and just threw it. And the thing is, Andrage met it halfway as well. She was yeah. lunging forward, so she hit yeah. that shot with such with such impact. And and you're right, like it felt like Andrage, and I love watching Andrage fight a one one five, and she literally just went in there to just blitz her and and she weathered the storm for the, the, the two minutes and then boom. Yeah. Great. Loved it. Yeah. Loved it. Super exciting. Um, I mean, Andrade seemed to recover very quickly. Um, I don't think it was a, yeah. a, a nasty, nasty knockout. She seemed to be be up and and, and, and chatting very, very uh, quickly. So, yeah, be interested to see what's next for uh, Andrade. Um she can flip between them weights. She's always in great fights. So I think, you know, she's always going to get good fights and put on performances like that. I think maybe she just misjudged the situation a little bit last night. There's a, maybe a lot of other fighters yeah. in that situation would have just kind of buckled a little bit more and just kept moving and kept moving rather than just thinking, right, I'm going to buy it down and throw it back now. But, uh, I mean, I'll tell you what, a great back pocket fight for the UFC and for um, Andrade is... Uh, I still want to see the trilogy with Rose. Yeah. It's a massive fight, and I still want to see the trilogy with Rose. Um, you know, uh, I always say this when we talk about a second fight between Rose and Andrade, that if that was a five-round fight, I think Andrade would have won it because she was coming on so strong in that third round. Um, so, yeah, I, I think they're one and one Make that trilogy fight between Rose and Andrade. Everyone will want to watch that. It's a 
a good fight back for Rose when she comes back. It's a great fight for Andrade, and you see what happens there. But yeah, the, the, the real tough moment for her today, and maybe a sort of changing of the guard at, at yeah. one fifteen. Maybe maybe Andrade is kind of lost that little bit two fight losing streak now, and yeah. um, and maybe Yan Xiaonan is is the one to come through and give Zhang Weili a good test. Absolutely. Um, I need you to fill in the gaps now, Blake, because okay, um, that's, that's all I've it. seen at the moment. So I'm all over it. What a performance. Big shout out to Diego Lopez. Coming to this fight on just like a couple of weeks notice or whatever it was, was not signed to the UFC. And he goes straight in there to fight an undefeated featherweight top 10 killer in Movzar Evloev. A lot of people don't want to fight him. He's very, very good. And Diego Lopez gave him an absolutely fantastic fight to the point where it earned fight of the night for both him and Evloev. Evloev won, but it was close and it was super exciting. You've got to go back and watch this one, Stu. Mm -hmm. um, a great first round. I actually gave it to Lopez uh, because he the first cracked round. him. I gave the first, first round to Lopez. He cracked him on the feet. Um, and then from bottom, even though Evloev was on top, he did a little bit of ground and pound, but there was some really mean submission attempts from uh, from Lopez, one of which looked like could it was a fight-ending scenario. There was a deep, deep arm bar in that first round, and it was he looks brilliant. I mean, he looked massive for the weight class as well, and he took it on short notice. So I am really excited to see uh, Diego Lopez come back on a full fight campaign and get a good fight under his belt uh, at featherweight. Uh, but as the fight went on, as it happens when people take fights on short notice, sometimes Lopez just seemed to lose a bit of steam. Yeah. He just got a bit more tired and Evlo had hand his way with him a little bit more. But again, even in that third round, that fight in Brazilian spirit was really there from Lopez. He got a really close Kamora, a deep knee bar right at the end of the round that really could have finished it. And Evlo had looked like he was in pain at points, but he just calmed down, sat for it. He knew he was going to get the decision. Lopez showed a good chin. He got cracked a few times in that second round. He showed decent boxing and a really mean ground game. Um, yeah. it, this is like one of these guys that's just come out absolutely nowhere for me. And I'm now like, I'm really looking forward to seeing this guy back in the octagon. And I, I really hope he does well. Because to do what he did against Evloev on short notice, I think that's quite special. Um, yeah. But... The win did go to Evloev. We shouldn't discredit him at all. He's now 17-0, and 0, I think. Top 10 in the featherweight division. Was supposed to be fighting Bryce Mitchell, but then he got injured. Um, I don't know what's next for Evloev. I think he mentioned Chang Sun Jung, the Korean zombie, but then that uh, looks like Max Holloway called him out a while ago, and that's probably a bigger fight for, for the Korean zombie. Oh, I want that fight. He's gonna I, retire. Want that fight. I want that fight. I don't know if I do want that fight, because I think Max is going to absolutely pepper him up and light mm. his face up and it's going to be a pretty sad retirement for the Korean zombie but who knows um, maybe it's better to go out against a legend like Max than it would be to fight a Mobzar Evloev for example but um, yeah I mean Evloev deserves a big fight I would like to see Arnold Allen still fight someone around him but hey you've got to fight someone massive uh, you, I mean you've got to fight someone behind you when, when you've lost and maybe Evloev is that guy I'd like to see uh, Arnold Allen fight like a Brian Ortega, for example. But who knows? Maybe Calvin Cater could fight Evloev. Um, Giga Chikadze's there as well. There's definitely some options for Evloev, and he deserves a, a big fight now. I'd say 17-0. and 0. Um, Charles uh, Air Jordan, love that nickname, uh, went up against Cron Gracie. And this was a weird one because it was a lot of people have said this now, that uh, Cron Gracie, it was like, uh, he'd come out of a time capsule from uh, from the 90s uh, and was just fighting with one style the whole time. Was he wearing he was, a gi? He, was, he might as well have been wearing a gi. Uh, and uh, that's no joke. He offered nothing on the feet uh, to Jordan. And whenever he got close to him, he just pulled guard and brought him down. And then Charles Jordan was very, very conservative, very, very defensive when in Cron Gracie's guard, as you should be, properly tucked up, like like almost in like a kind of boxing guard mm -hmm. within the guard, if that makes sense. Like his, his arms were glued to his head and chest. He was giving Cron nothing, no opportunities for arm bars, anything like that. And eventually when he got back to the feet, he just lit Cron up on the feet. And there were moments where Cron was chasing him around on his ass, trying to engage with him whilst he was on the floor and... and 
Jordan was was on the feet. Uh, a very easy 30-27 for, for Jordan. It was not a good look for for Cron Gracie, really. He does look behind the pace. And people were talking about, you know, years ago, these specialists, they they could have their way with some people. Uh, and Jordan still, I think, I don't know if they said a brown belt or a black belt in, in, in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I think it's a brown belt. But obviously, you know, he's got he's in a Gracie's guard. He's not going to make, he's going to be very defensive. But it was just about the fact that Modern day mixed martial artists, you have to have a well rounded game. You can't just be an amazing striker and have very little takedown defense. You have to be able to wrestle a bit and keep the fight on the feet. And the same with your grappler. You have to be able to at least implement some decent boxing and striking to get to the takedowns, to get to the clinch, to drag someone down. If you're offering nothing but the jujitsu, it's not going to work for you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Rough night for Drew Dober, by the looks of things. Yeah, man. It was, again, really, you watch that one. That was a nice, quick, fun fight. Just throwing, slanging and banging, throwing hands at each other. Provola, after I think it was a big uh, right hook, uh, knocked him down. Drew Dober disputed the stoppage, but I think it was a good stoppage. He he was a bit rocked and he'd ate a few shots and I think he was only going to eat some more. Um, But Provola now probably ranked 14th at lightweight. Calls out Paddy Pimlet. Don't think anyone's going to make that fight if I'm honest it'd be a great way for Paddy to maybe fight a ranked guy but I, I think you know Paddy's having surgery he's got all this other stuff going on um I, I, I don't bagged himself 50 G's as well, well. yes with a yeah we were, he deserved it as well it was a really really great finish so we'll see see what happens there for Frivola again should probably be either defending his ranked spot from someone that's very, very good, but outside the rankings or maybe getting lucky and fighting a ranked guy, but it would make, maybe that's a great call out by him in terms of Paddy, because as much as he probably won't get it, if he did get it, that's him defending his spot against a fighter that he feels like clearly he can beat. And then uh, going forward, he fights up the rankings. So that's probably a good call out. And again, if you fight Paddy, especially if you could beat him, I think it does a lot for your star power, your social media following, all that stuff, because Paddy is such a big star. Um, uh, Kennedy and Chikuku, uh, he fought Devin Clark. Uh, we got a guillotine finish in round two. Uh, that was a good fight. And then a really crazy fight was uh, Chaos Williams versus Bedoya. Um, I thought that could have been fight of the night, to be fair. They were just going at each other, eating each other's shots for breakfast and then coming back with more. That was a really fun fight. Uh, but that went the distance and Chaos Williams got a, maybe a slightly controversial split decision. I think I scored it for Bedoya. But at that point, that's when I was holding pads for my sons. <laughs> <It> was, uh, <laughs> but I was not giving it my full attention. Apologies. And then we have to mention... Um, uh, Vina Jandiroba against Marina Rodriguez because despite the fact that this opened the prelims, these were two highly ranked strawweights and Vina Jandiroba got it was by no means exciting uh, but she got the win uh, decision over uh, over Marina Rodriguez she run the first two rounds just by grappling and being on top and laying a bit of ground and pound on Marina, I think one round three, she cracked her on the feet a little bit and then even when she was on bottom, she was still landing more strikes so yeah. I gave Marina round three but Vina Jandarova now in the top five. I'd have to pull up the rankings quickly to see what we could see is next for her. Um, but she's just fought someone way above her. So it's very possible that she'll have to defend her position now. But yeah, she yeah. should be ranked fifth. And uh, I would say, gosh, I mean, I don't know what Carla Esparza is up to. I think she's having a big break at the moment. And Draj just fought. Lamos is more title contention, I think. So that shouldn't be a fight for her. And Draj just lost. Um, so I think she's going to have to fight behind her in the rankings. I think Mackenzie Dern's just booked a fight. Is yeah, she's fighting Angela, Angela Hill? Hill. Yeah. Yeah, so she's fighting Angela Hill. Oh. Tatiana Suarez. Yeah, let's, let's, I'll, I'll be all over that. Well, just because I'm I'm a big fan of Tatiana Suarez, I think she's absolutely fantastic, and um, she's a big name. Maybe that's unfair to be an agenda robot. I mean, at least you've got someone with some good grappling to battle against Tatiana Suarez's wrestling. Uh, that could be a really interesting fight, actually. So we'll see. I think I'd like to see that because I'd like to see mm. Tatiana Suarez sort of fast tracked through the division because she did so well previously, was close to a title shot, then had this horrific injury and was out for like four years. So I'd like to see her pushed uh, very quickly 
back towards the top of the division. So I'll go Tatiana Suarez as my pick for for Vienna's next fight, which maybe isn't fair on Vienna. But if she were to win yeah. it, then that's that's massive for her and that's a big statement. And that is <laughs> that is me done. I didn't watch any of the fight pass prelims, so uh, I can't they were all they were all KO by that. looks of things. So um, I'll, I'll definitely be checking them out. Um, yeah, two of them were first round stoppages, and one second round stoppage. So there's uh, lots of action to be uh, to be enjoyed on the uh, the fight pass prelim. So I'm going to um, get a chance later on and uh, check them out. Um, what have we got coming up next? What's the next event? Oh, the next event I believe is Gel. I'll have to double check it, but I believe it's Gelton Almeida Canada. versus um, uh, what's his face, uh, Jairzinho Rosenstreich. It is. It um, is. Which, I mean, I think Jelton Almeida is, I mean, he's someone that could make light heavyweight. He's not by any means a big heavyweight, but his wrestling and jujitsu is very, very special. Um, I'd have to just pull up his, uh, his topology just to see what kind of run he's on at the moment. But he is no joke. He's very possibly, I mean, he could be, a, I, I think Jelton Almeida fantastic with his grappling and wrestling and stuff that could cause problems to so many people in that heavyweight division and I think Rosenstroke being a striker and you know not always the most athletic in comparison to someone like Jelton I think that Jelton will have his way with him and I can see Jelton getting a very early finish in this fight he's 18 and 2 he's 1, 2, 3 4 Four fight win streak in the UFC. Before that, he came in with a win in the Contender Series. Takes part in grappling competitions all the time. He's got a lot of wins there as well. Uh, he does have two losses on his record, but they were quite a long time ago, 2018 and 2017. Uh, but I think where Jonathan Almeida will eventually find problems is he comes into his heavyweight fights at like 220 something. If he's fighting someone with decent wrestling or decent grappling, like for example, a Tom Aspinall or a Curtis Blades or someone like that, who's also going to be 30, 40 pounds heavier than him. Yeah, yeah. Then that's when he's going to have some big, big issues when he reaches like the top five of the heavyweight division. But I'm expecting him to do big things, look good, and either do very well at heavyweight and prove me wrong in, in terms of size difference or drop down to light heavyweight where I think he could really do bits down there as well. So Jelton Almeida, if you don't know about him, Check him out on Saturday night. I think this guy could be a big deal uh, in a bit. And he's still young for those heavier weights. He's only 31 years old. So, uh, and he's yeah, missed Johnny Walker on the undercard as well. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, uh, Angela and Hill, Mackenzie Dunn, and our boy Ian Gary. Oh, yes. Ian Gary's fight. Is he still fighting Daniel Rodriguez? Uh, let me double check. Uh, D Rod. Yes, he is. That is a great fight. That's a huge step up for, for Ian Gary. And I've just seen Rodriguez is actually ranked 15 as well. So that means from that point on, Ian Gary will be a, a ranked guy. So best of luck to, to Ian Gary. Rodriguez is no joke. He's really good striker, hits hard. But got, you've got to favour Ian. I mean, obviously, we're, we're biased. We, we love Ian. But I think Ian's got some really crisp striking. But it will be Ian's probably toughest test so far. So mm -hmm. I think um, that will be really good. And that Johnny Walker, Anthony Smith fight, we've discussed this before, light heavyweight is all over the frigging shop. Mm -hmm. So a big win for one of those guys, particularly a finish, and they could be looking at a title shot. You know, it's, it's yeah. not out of the question at all um, because that division is all over the shop. And we still don't know whether Yuri Prohashka is going to be back anytime soon. Um so, so yeah, Rakic still injured, Blahovic and Ankalaev, what's going on with them after their draw? Um, yeah, could could be big things for the winner in that fight. Could be a lot at stake there. So, actually, this Saturday is a very, very sneaky good card. Mm. And some of the fight nights lately haven't been that great. But this is a good one. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, right, I think we're, we're done, aren't we? We're done, mate. We're done. Um Thanks very much for listening, guys. You know, if you haven't done yet, please hit the subscribe button if you're watching this on YouTube or if you're on the podcast. Please give us, you know, a nice little review, a cheeky little five stars, maybe. Uh, and, uh, yeah, follow us on the on the socials as well. Um, Absolutely. And I want to say that, yeah, let's, um, let's shout out some of the stuff that people might have missed if they um, if they've just stumbled across this, this episode today. Um, a lot of the time, Blake and I chat to guests, and um, we've had a great roster of guests that you can go and listen to or watch for free 
uh, in the archives of this show. There's over 130 shows now, I think. And you can hear us chatting to the aforementioned Tom Aspinall, uh, Jamal Hill, um, gosh, Tyron Woodley, Michael Bispin, Alexander Volkanovsky, Dan Hardy, Mark Goddard, just not just fighters we have, you know, we've had um, pundits and and uh, and referees on, and it, we've had some absolutely delightful chats. But you mentioned Paddy earlier, we've had Paddy on a couple of times, and uh, as you can imagine, they're uh, they're very fun chats, and uh, and they're all to be enjoyed for free. Also, Blake and I uh, and the MMA Fan Podcast are on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. So if you search MMA Fan Podcast on any of them platforms. Um, come and give us a follow because we put up loads of little news articles over there and uh, and little video snippets of all of these chats and uh, and yeah, head over there, give us a follow, drop us a message and uh, and yeah, and we'll be back next time. Thanks very much, guys. Bye.